and <clears throat> it's really, really a pleasure to be here at this conference, the second edition. And as Dean was telling, it is a bigger, larger version. And indeed, it's great to be here. And I've been out on campus for the last few days, and every day there are struggling functions by petroleum engineers, by IT students. So this place is indeed, you know, greatly present. But coming to the topic of the day, I mean, when this speech was given to me, I was asking the organizers, you know, 2030 is a long horizon, and how come 2030? So they were saying that it's a mission of this nation, it's a mission of this nation to be counted as a developed nation by 2030. So that's where the whole conference theme is about, and what are the ways and means in development of various kinds of infrastructure to take this country to the need of the developed nation. Well, I mean, our theme today would run on uh, this and this brief presentation about 15 minutes can encompass the challenge part of it because opportunities are definitely there and will always be there in a growing nation. But the issue is how to overcome the challenges to make these changes happen. And uh, that's what we want to concentrate upon. So. <clears throat> So agenda is uh, briefly the vision 2030 India, a developed nation, as I said, and that's the theme. And then we look into some of the opportunities in EIT, followed by challenges, and a small case study of a very interesting project, a very complex infrastructure project, which has faced myriad of challenges ever since its inception. And then, towards the end, what else is largely this is an academic conference, what is there for us academics, the teachers, the students, the deans, and where do we take it from here? Let's, let's begin with EIT. And uh, so Dean did mention that EIT stands for Energy Infrastructure and Transportation. And it's a term which has been coined by us because this is the, the realm or this is the continuum that we straddle. We started this university with the core of energy, oil, gas, stretched the balloon to power, nuclear, renewable, stretch it further to transportation, automotive, maritime, aviation, and then do it further to the infrastructure, which is the roads, bridges, civil infrastructure, soft infrastructure. So EIT is something that is core to us. EIT is the domain we straddle. And it's a great domain to be because the nation is driven by this domain. And as you know, if you count the oil and gas refineries, exploration, power plants, put it all together, it constitutes to over 50% of the GDP in India. Also, this is what drives the nation, and if there are no roads, there are no transportation facilities, the manufacturing will not get the raw materials, products will not get to markets, the retail industry, the agriculture will not boom. So it touches all facets of the economy, whether it's agricultural economy or manufacturing sector or the service sector. And without EIT development, nothing will happen. And it is the basis of naturally the development of the entire country. And that's why I mean, some of you see our new logo, and we call ourselves now, the moniker says, Nation Builders University. So that is what everything, anything that we do or teach goes into the building of the nation. And that's, that's the core, core to us. Well, some key indicators which are generally used uh, to see whether you are catching up to the developed world or not. And today the biggest parameter is the internet, internet because most of us live on the virtual worlds and with the advent of smartphones and tabs and tablets and what have you. You know, everybody is connected all the time and we have to look into the one of the biggest, uh, you know, parameter of being a developed nation is the internet penetration. Though we have come a long way in the last 10 years, but if you look even in comparison to Eurozone and US, we are nowhere close. Air transportation, we are developing and glad that one of our chief guests is from the aviation industry. But still, our general aviation and the kind of number of flights that take off, departures that happen every day, we are far, far lesser. And same holds true for the per capita power consumption or the passenger car. So these also indicate that there are opportunities in sector. The you know, up till a little slow down last year, there was a huge growth in the kind of transportation industry. Some of us were at the auto expo and the kind of vehicles that are emerging out of India, electrical vehicles, hybrid vehicles, big vehicles, small vehicles, luxury vehicles, you name it, it is it was on the display at the auto expo. 
But having said that, and that's the challenge that in the next 17 odd years would we be able to reach parity or near parity with some of these key indicators, and that's something to deliberate upon. Uh, in this country, we are great in planning, we put great things on paper, but the ultimate challenge is to make it happen. And even for next couple of years, we have huge plans that we will open new 50 airports in various states. I'm sure uh, our chief guest would dwell on some of these ideas. Two major ports will be built, many local manufacturing units will come up, elevated corridor, rail corridor in Mumbai, dedicated freight transportation corridor in eastern India, power generation projects, transportation projects, what have you. But would all this happen? And one last thing very interesting is that since we are moving up uh, into the electric vehicle or hybrid vehicle space, the infrastructure to support electric vehicle and transportation uh, hybrid vehicle is also being thought to. And much, one must tell this audience because largely comprises of UPS uh, students and faculty. One of our first generation entrepreneur who runs the company, most of you will know by the name of Gensol, is now you know diversifying into a project and he has taken a couple of pilot projects, I think in Gujarat, to build this infrastructure for hybrid or electrical vehicles. So there are close to bus stations, there will be a pole, there will be charging stations. You park your electric vehicle, get it charged and get it running on. So these are the very interesting new dimensions, new areas and the entrepreneurs in India are latching on, catching on to these kind of opportunities and moving on. So let's come to what are the set of opportunities in the larger EIT sector, how it's going to transform in the next few years and then we look into the challenges as well. Oil and gas. Uh, shale gas has transformed the American energy sector and the prices in America of gas have you know, really taken a turn. But we feel, and I'm sure one of our, we have a distinguished people in this audience, like uh, Mr. B.S. Negi, etc., who would probably want to touch upon some of these developments. The thinking of having the first shale block auctioning rounds if the policy and the philosophy then goes and gets sorted out. Major investments in because FDI is now permissible up to 51% in the refinery sector. We have a, one such refinery in Patinda, and the Opal is talking to Saudi Aramco for a billion dollar investment. And refinery sector informed, like I said, 51% FDI route is available, which was not there, and that will drive the next growth. India as it is, uh, is a product surplus nation, though most people, you know, I mean, this question is often asked and most people are not able to answer. Because yes, we are crude deficient, we import 70% or more than 70% of crude, but we do export over 20% of our gasoline, diesel and other things. So we are a product surplus, we are emerging deeply as a hub of refinery nation and if you look into the installation in Gujarat itself and the Vadinar and uh, Jamnagar area, they constitute a huge block of refining capacity worldwide. So these are the opportunities and opportunities, and that's the opportunity this university ties on. It creates these, uh, these opportunities will get created and our students will get you know, outstanding employment in these, in these sectors in times to come. Coal is another thing, and uh, that's where, uh, you know, if you can see in this Yes, portfolio of UPS, we are adding mining uh, engineering to this year's portfolio because coal is the next big thing. And India has a huge amount of coal, so only the issue that Indian coal is not very clean and it produces high, far higher ash content than anybody else. But technologies have emerged since, since the, you know, the days of apartheid in uh, South Africa where you could uh, gasify coal or liquefy coal underground and produce gaseous fuel or liquid fuel and mitigate the ash hazards of uh, burning the Indian coal. And some of the coal mines in India are deep, some of them have depleted to a depth where open pit mining is not possible. And the technology of uh, underground coal gasification, so that, those are the new avenues in mining, in gas industry, our gas engineering students and uh, there are new projects, Coal India is also trying to see, but again, as we'll come to the challenges, it's more not the, just the opportunities, more issue of policies, more issue of how to make it, make it happen, but these things are definitely on the horizon. 
power uh, in last uh, few years uh, to ultra mega power plants both in Mundra and Sasan have come on stream. Another 64,000 megawatt capacity is in pipeline. But again, question is that there are the, I mean, a lot of people are struggling, a lot of large companies are struggling because they have created these assets. They have no coal, they have no gas, and these assets are lying idle and bank charges are mounting, banks are having NPAs. And that's, that's a huge question. And on one side, we say that we are energy deficient country, the intensity is not there. But these are all clear, also realities of this nation. <coughs> Next big thing uh, is the renewable energy, and everybody talks a lot about renewable energy. Renewable energy is like a holy grail for many, many years, and the reason is that it's the cost effectiveness of renewable energy, and there is a well known saying as long as the dollar pricing of per barrel of oil remains $100 or below none of the renewable technologies actually make sense in terms of business. It's only when the very crosses $100 per barrel, then some of these technologies come. But having said that, India in the last four, five, six years have made a tremendous stride in the solar energy with the National Solar Mission coming on stream, with the huge uh, investments in wind power had happened down south, where the wind potential was there. And also government has talked about the feeding tariffs to support this, but they are again on paper, the policy is not definition what tariff it would be, what would these developers get. Also there are policies of that, you know, most distribution companies must source 1-2% to two percent of their power from renewable sources. Again, where are the renewable sources, whether they fulfill those commitments or not, those are the issues. But renewable energy is next big thing and for this country where there is a huge solar potential, and a lot of uh, arid and semi-arid uh, lands in Rajasthan and Gujarat and other places where the big solar farms can come, but that's another growth. Roads and highways. The roads and highways, uh, you can see, I mean, most of us who live in metropolises and even now there are those we have chaotic uh, road conditions. And when modern roads get built, like Yamuna Expressway or, you know, Delhi Gurgaon Expressway, then comes the issues of, you know, people put these big ambitious projects with 20 year concessionary period or 30 year concessionary period. Then political elements or other elements say that no toll and they violate uh, the toll premises and then because in this country the concept of paying for road usage is a very alien concept and nobody wants to pay for driving on a road or riding a bus on a road. But if that does not happen and that does not become a self uh, <coughs> stable regime, then PPP projects and Ports would have very, very difficult time going ahead. <coughs> Another area is rail, and rail has been lifeblood of India since British Raj, and uh, it's the lifeline, whether it's of Mumbai or the rest of India, it's the one single thing which you know, connects all Indians across north, south, east, west, all strata of Indian from poor to rich, and train or rail is one thing which, is, which, which has been there and will continue to be there in this country. But what's happening recently is, uh, for the first time, for urban public transportation, many new projects in metros have come. And Delhi Metro was a successful project, then it got extended by Gujarat in, a, uh, sorry, in uh, by Gurgaon, by creating a feeder metro to Delhi Metro, which was built under a public-private participation in Chennai, Mumbai, Kochi, everybody is now looking into this. Some people, some, in some towns, the projects are already underway. Sometimes some sections have been inaugurated, but that's the next big thing, the metro train or the public uh, transportation in our urban centers. Dedicated trade corridors also, for movement of you know, goods, large goods or raw materials like coal, steel, cement, and so dedicated rail, rail trade corridors, which were again initially done in public-private participation, were being built. And for this, locomotives, new generation locomotives, which are more fuel efficient, power efficient, and having more haulage capacities are being designed and built. So these are another great uh, in the transportation arena. Ports and airports, uh, these have been, again, and India has been always on seaport map since the traditional days from Vasco da Gama to what we have today. And ports, uh, and people said ports will have uh, no relevance, but ports do have relevance and uh, for large kind of uh, 
tonnages, they are the most optimum transportation. And as we see, even in the gas industry, LNG transportation, etc., requires very specially configured uh, seaports. Airports, as we saw earlier in the data, we are deficient in number of services. Uh, the civil aviation or general aviation sector hardly exists here. So, obviously, it does say that 50 new airports will come this year and another 50 airports, but then whether they are sustainable, whether traffics are enough, where non air revenues can sustain and that based on, you know, the retail facilities or integrated acropolises are created. But then again, these are the challenges or the issues which are built around new airport development. So, at, so these are the, you know, a brief gamut of across the various elements of energy, infrastructure, transportation, the opportunities. But let's look into the challenges. Biggest challenge this last five, six years has been the policy paralysis. And there was a stat a couple of days back in, I think, Times of India, which showed that this particular Lok Sabha has been most worst performing uh, Lok Sabha ever in, since independence. And the huge number of bills are going to lapse. And nothing really got transacted in the last three, four. I think it was absolute chaos in the, in the Parliament. <clears throat> also, last four or five years, scams, CAG commands, CBI cases led to a huge amount of closure or shutdown of virtual paralysis in the decision making uh, paraphernalia of government. Many policy issues have remained unsolved for the last four years, and again, which also includes our NELP rounds and NELP blocks, and which has led to, you know, a huge shake-up in the economy because the last 10 years since the end of this century, we have been witnessing 8 to 7 to 8 percent economic growth rates and that's where the huge economy growth and gains have happened. And we also as a university have ridden this wave of glorious 10, 12 years and all the sectors that we straddle have grown hugely. So that's a huge challenge and huge issue and one of the biggest challenges and that's so we get a better governing government in the forthcoming uh, midterm, not midterm, the forthcoming general elections. And again, you know, our planning is whatever was needed was needed yesterday, by the time those capacities come on stream, they become downsized. You know, one classic example is Bangalore Airport, it was built, and the day it got inaugurated, the capacity got overrun, and then it had to build another terminal. So these are the things, and the airport will be congested, we feel that hugely, the T3 will be serving very nicely, but T3 is also getting, you know, slowly and slowly congested. Uh, trains are crowded, buses are crowded, trains are crowded, hardly any blacktop uh, roads exist, or the quality blacktop roads exist. So these are, you know, everything was needed yesterday, but whether it will even happen tomorrow, that is the challenge. Finally, a uh, couple of more points. Land acquisition, rehabilitation, and resettlement. You know, a lot of people, some of us, have been going to China, see Beijing or Shanghai, and people say that we'll make Mumbai, Shanghai, and we will make Delhi, Beijing, but that's not possible in a country like us where there are huge issues of land acquisition, rehabilitation of people. In China, they just simply clean up every place. Next day, you have a spanking the new apartment building, but then that's the price you have to pay in a authoritarian society or a democratic society. So that is a choice, but whether other that choice is leading to growth or leading to non-growth, those are again, this young generation will have to take those calls. <coughs> red tape, that's a, again a brain in this country, the huge amount of red tapeism. You, know, you can see some of the files, some of the government offices and see the file and I don't know whether Anybody can discover the relevant file on these people as is shown. But some states are progressive. But some states have invested into e-governance, e-decord. A lot of states like AP and I think to a great degree in Gujarat too. You have uh, electronic land records possible, so you can verify the land holdings, ownerships. And uh, now we look into a small case study for a minute, which is the MTHL project. <coughs> which is Mumbai Harbour Translink project. This is a very interesting, very huge and complex project, which is Mumbai Trans Harbour Link. It was conceived way back in the 70s, 
or of a 22 kilometer link between Mumbai Central and Navi Mumbai with eight lanes highway, expressway, one lane rail line. And it kept on getting embroiled into many, many issues and this is a saga of almost 40 years and still, you know, and lastly we see the end acquisition possibly happen, environmental clearances have come, other regulatory approvals have happened, but the price which was, uh, the cost which was about half a billion is now escalated to 1.5 billion. And now the issue is that there are the long-term financiers for this project, so they are having a huge issue in getting it financial closure of this project. So those, this is, this is a classical and maybe probably the worst case uh, scenario possible that 40 years, a huge mega project didn't make it to the day of the light. So that's that. Finally, let me conclude with uh, what's in there for us academics. Opportunity for academic fraternity in, in this uh, segment is huge and uh, one of the biggest uh, area of research or study is the environmental impact because all the projects, whether it's in oil and gas, and because, um, I'm sure those who are conversant read about the shale gas impacts and US uh, green lobby, how they oppose uh, shale gas developments in various uh, locations in the US. So impact of uh, various uh, energy sector, infrastructure, transportation sector projects to the, our ecosystem. Another area is, you know, what would uh, lead to long-term economic growth or societal impacts, you know, society modes and society societal impacts also change. You know, and one biggest is the information technology when we were young, we used to play with each other and, you know, now everybody plays candy floss on Facebook <laughs> and they're happy and we keep on inviting each other for playing something on Facebook but hardly a uh, social or personal or contact sport in the evening which was enjoyable in our younger days, but that's the way it is. Assessment studies and feasibility growth studies, consulting for when uh, Mr. Tolia was the Chief Secretary, we did support Uttarakhand uh, government in a couple of very interesting uh, projects, including for Uttarakhand Road Transportation Corporation and also for the IT department, where we looked into setting up of the kiosks for farmers to get real-time information on weather conditions and other conditions. So those are all the opportunities available to young people and I don't want to end it on the, because this generation sitting here who is undergoing the courses in EIT must feel positive not negative about it. Opportunities are huge and challenges are always huge but in this country, as they say, the God runs this country, we always overcome the challenges somehow and make it happen. All the best and have a wonderful two-day deliberation on this theme. And all of us. Thank you very much, Dr. Vivan, for your presentation and also for letting us pick your sound bites on opportunity challenges in energy, transportation, and infrastructure sectors. May I please request Dr. Neeraj Aran to step forward and give away the memento to Dr. Vivan as a token of her thanks.